And Mike, would you like to say a few words of welcome? Absolutely. So I just want to thank folks who are able to join us today. I know it's uh, uh, we have another evening one. We tried to match the times based on different family uh, needs and dynamics. Uh, but this is really exciting. You know, we're, we're you know now have a designer, uh, owner, project manager. We have a great building committee. Thank you, Kathy Shane, who's on this call, who's the chair of the building committee. Thanks for all your work. And, and now we get to sort of the you know from my vantage point as an educator, the more interesting part, which is around the educational plan. Uh, what we're developing, what we're designing, and then uh, in short order, some initial thoughts about, uh, you know, site and all that stuff. David, we're not going to do those types of things today, and I think David will address that. Uh, but, you know, I know for people who have been following the building project, you know, uh, with all due respect to our OPM and designers who are on the call, you know, that process is a little, feels a little bit like a slog, procurement, interviews, right? And, and this, it feels a little divorced from uh, the real reason why we're doing this, which is improve the learning experiences for our students here in Amherst. And so, you know, I'm just really excited to be working with the team. I'm really excited David Stevens with us to be facilitating this. And, and I'm particularly excited that we have uh, lots of folks on this call to offer feedback at the beginning part of this process, which is iterative. It'll continue to uh, iterate <laughs> for many months on end, uh, but really to offer their thoughts and feedback uh, to really guide this process and deeply appreciative of the commitment of the community for their engagement in this. So um, really thank you. Uh, and I think at this point, I'll turn it over to David to kind of set us off for the next couple hours and what's going to happen. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is David Steven. I'm with New Vista Design in Boston. I'm the educational programmer on the team with Danisco Design. And I think what I, I have an introductory activity um, that I've planned as part of the presentation. But I think what I'd like to do first is just have um, our design team introduce themselves quickly and just say a quick hello. And we'll start with Donna. Good morning, everyone. This is Donna Danisco. Nice to see you all. And Vivian. Hi, everyone. My name is Vivian Lowe, and I'm with Danisco. Uh, Rick. Good morning, everybody. Nice to meet you. Tim. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Tim Cooper. And Colin. Hi, everybody. Uh, Colin Finch with Danisco. And Brian. Brian, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning, everybody. Okay. And we also have Margaret Wood. And I don't know if Margaret, she said she was going to be going through some, she might drop off because of reception, but she'll be back on with us. And she's the OPM for the project, the owner's project manager. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and uh, jump into things here. Can everybody see that? Can I have a thumbs up if you can see it? All right, great. All right, so um, yes, so um, we are, as Mike said, we're at the beginning of this iterative process, what we call educational visioning. Um, this is uh, what we'd like to do today, and we have two and a half hours scheduled. We know that some people might need to drop off. We really appreciate you spending time with us today. We know it's a, a very, it's busy, it's the work day, and there's a lot going on within the school system given Omicron right now. So we do really appreciate people being here. Um, what we'd like to do is to um, review the work to date and gather community feedback as we begin, begin this, this new process um, of looking at the Amherst Elementary School. And um, so what I've done is I've created some um, agenda items uh, to offer first an overview, and then we'll do some introductions. Um, we'll do some priority goal setting. And, um, and we'll look at some of the Amherst Elementary Learning Goals and key programs um, that, um, that we're considering as we consider this building. Uh, we're then gonna take a break. We know that it, when we're doing virtual meetings, it's really important to get up and be able to move around and take a bit of a break or check your emails. Um, we'll come back and we'll focus more on architectural, the architectural end of things. We're gonna be talking more about kind of educational uh, focus area. Right, right, right. First part. Join the meeting. Uh, let's see. And I'm going to ask my co-hosts here from Danisco if as people are um, are entering, if I, I should see them, but just make sure that um, we're letting people in as they enter. Thank you very much. So we'll get into talking about architectural end of things. 
Um, and uh, we're going to share what we call design patterns that have been discussed and prioritized uh, within, uh, within this process thus far. And, um, and we'll talk about blue sky ideas. And then we'd also, we're going to save some time for questions and concerns uh, for district consideration. So we want this to be a really interactive um, process, both this meeting and the, the feasibility process in general. And, um, and we're really, as Michael said, we're going to be focusing on high level visioning. So we're going to be discussing educational and architectural priorities that are being established for the project so that we can use them as lenses through which to evaluate options. We know we're going to be through an MSBA feasibility study. We have to look at renovation. We have to look at renovation addition. And we have to look at new construction. So this process is really, um, again, the high level. Um, it doesn't engage. It's, it's not about what site we're selecting. Um, it's not about which option in terms of a, a Fort River K-5 or a combined Fort River Wildwood K-5, um, but it's more creating the educational and architectural um, priorities that are going to be um, the lenses through which we look at all of those different options. And we're looking, at, uh, we're going to be keeping notes from these meetings and other meetings, and all of the presentations we do can be found at the project website, which is at this um, uh, email uh, right here or um, at this URL right, uh, that you can see here, that's the, that's the project website. So in terms of visioning, just big picture, um, this is a process that the MSBA requires for um, schools going through um, its feasibility studies. Um, it really wants to make sure, the MSBA wants to make sure that districts are considering um, kind of future forward ideas about their educational vision, how a building will last for decades to come, how they might design a building that we're, that's not going to be obsolete within 10 to 20 years because we need this building to last for, for 50 years. And so um, the process is sequential. We have educational vision priorities that we'll be discussing. We'll connect them to ideas about architectural design and guiding principles. Um, and that ultimately connects to key spaces and adjacencies. And that all connects also to the education plan that the district is creating um, uh, for this project and has been in the process of creating. So we've already spoken um, to the educational leadership team in the district. Um, and then we're looking at these meetings as kind of creating an educational working group where we get uh, feedback. We'll be talking to faculty as well. Um, this will not be the only opportunity. Um, we have another one of these workshops that will be taking place on when, the evening of Wednesday, January 26th. But I did want to um, point out that although we're starting this project fresh, we also have a lot of information, especially with regard to the educational priorities that the district has been establishing. And that is through um, the process that went on um, for the Amherst Elementary School Visioning. Um, that was uh, in 2015 and, and 2016, uh, connected to that project. There were visioning group workshops, there were community meetings, and there was a comprehensive set of educational and architectural priorities um, that was created for all ARPS elementary schools. Those groups included representatives from all three elementary schools within the district. Um, now, we also, uh, in the process, the district has created a draft education plan um, that incorporated many of those priorities. And I guess one, one thing to, to just be aware is that there's a lot of um, sort of uh, connectivity and a lot of focus that these priorities have taken on in terms of across the district. Um, I don't think uh, people, people are, there's a lot of alignment in terms of what these learning goals are, what the guiding principles need to be educationally. Um, and what the teaching methodologies and structure um, are for, for each of your elementary schools. Um, also in 2019, TSK, TKSP was brought on to, um, to vet the needs of the educational program that were established so far and evaluate the existing conditions and options for renovation at the Fort River site. So we're taking that into account as well. And finally, and maybe even most importantly, um, each of the Amherst um, elementary schools has their own, what we call a school improvement plan. 
And those school improvement plans talk about the values of the, the school and what they're working on in terms of their educational focus areas. And there's an incredible amount of alignment there. And we're going to be talking about each of these things and how they might connect to uh, the design of a renovated or new building. So we, in this process, are looking to further develop this narrative that has been in this process already. Um, we want to make sure that we're also working with the district to optimize the MSBA space template and make sure that the priorities that we establish through these workshops and the feedback that we get is incorporated into and aligned with the educational plan that's being created. And so um, I also wanted to say too, that as we look at whether the building would be a renovation or a renovation addition or new construction, there are certain criteria that we can assume that any renovated or new building will have. And as we move into doing some priority setting in this context here, um, I just want to make sure that people understand that these are kind of givens um, in this process. So any, any renovated or new building, um, when we talk about renovation, we're really talking about if you've ever done a gut renovation in your home, it's all new systems, it's new windows, oftentimes new wall systems, um, new interior um, design uh, footprint. And, uh, but the building will be ADA compliant. It will be focusing on safe entry and security features. Um, it will have thermal comfort in terms of, it will have heating as well, uh, cooling as well as heating. This comes with modern technology and furniture. That's part of, um, of the MSBA uh, budgeting. And well, all classrooms will be well-sized because we know they have to be flexible and they'll all have natural light because we know how important that is. Other things that any new or renovated building will have is a focus on indoor outdoor connectivity. Um, we're looking at push in special education approach. Well, you may have some separate OTPT speech spaces. Um, we have to fully integrate the differentiated um, approaches to meeting students needs within the context of their classrooms or nearby. Um, we'll be focusing on safe drop off and pickup. Uh, the build, we know sustainability is incredibly important to the district, so we'll be looking at that very closely. And there will be an adequate number of distributed bathrooms and gender neutral bathrooms. So those are some of the, the, you know, the things that we know that any renovated or new building will have. So this is an opportunity in this phase, this high level phase, to really be aspirational about your thinking and to really try and envision what you would love for uh, this new building um, to be able to provide to students. So with that, I do, um, I want to um, give you an opportunity uh, to, um, to, to do some introductions. We have a rather, a, a larger group here. So um, I think it would be a little bit time consuming to have everybody introduce themselves within the larger context of the group. So what we're going to do is we're going to get into some, um, some breakout rooms. And let me just see, we have 27 participants. So I'm going to divide us into um, 10 different uh, breakout rooms, and these are going to be random. Um, but in that, in, within that, um, that breakout space, we're going to take about five minutes um, to, to just share your name, your role, and your greatest hope for this project. When we come back, we're going to have a chance to share that through an interactive platform called Mentimeter. Um, so you should be receiving um, uh, right now an invite to go into a smaller group. So if you could please um, just uh, click on that and within your groups again, share your name, your role within the district, whether it's parent or, um, or a teacher or an administrator, uh, community partner, and what your greatest hope is uh, for this project. Okay, so I'm gonna open all these rooms right now. You should be receiving a an invitation. Okay, welcome back. All right, um, what I'm gonna do now is um, I'm gonna um, open up this slide here. So throughout this, uh, this presentation um, uh, or uh, meeting, we would like to have you interact with and give us your thoughts and we're going to be able to see them on screen. This is anonymous. Uh, this, uh, this is like a poll, a polling platform called Mentimeter. 
So um, if you go to menti.com and then you um, enter in this code number, 72754835, you can also use the QR code code here with your phone. That'll bring you to that website as well. So if you open up another browser window, um, either on your, your laptop or your phone, um, then that will bring you to this slide right here. So um, uh, you each had an opportunity to share some of your greatest hopes uh, for, for the school project. And um, we'd like to ask you now to share them um, here with us. And what, what we'll start seeing is they'll, they'll appear on our screen. Um, and, um, and I would also just invite people open up for anybody who would like to turn on their, to unmute and share their priority uh, to do so for their greatest hope. Now we're gonna be doing a bunch of priority setting coming up in just a few minutes. So this is just the beginning of uh, talking about a whole range of priorities because we know that they're, they're not limited to one. So are people able to access the screen? Are we good? So uh, if you could enter in what your greatest hope is. Mm -hmm. So developing a, a school building plan that can be embraced by the community, learning from the past, but looking to the future, creating a great and better learning environment for students and staff, making sure that there's robust outreach across the community, uh, an opportunity for uh, a town divided to find healing and common ground through a process of dialogue and being heard. Um, in terms of the building, a beautiful integrated uh, building with the landscape, bright and engaging spaces, uh, modern security school shooting prevention. We're definitely going to be thinking about security, both passive and active, uh, broader, deeper outreach, genuine input from the entire community, taking that input uh, to land on an option that has widespread support. And we know that getting support for this is an incredibly important part of this process. Um, and also that Crocker Farm will not be forgotten in this process, that the community will come together on the plan. Uh, and, and also that Crocker Farm, will be thinking about what the needs of Crocker Farm uh, students and, um, and families are. Um, all right. Flexible space for hands-on learning, inspiring and engaging space for learning and teaching. Great. Um, so I did want to share with you some of the highlights um, in this, again, this process that has been um, ongoing, at least in terms of the educational underpinnings of it, and some of the ideas about how space can best support that. So we're trying to build off of that. Um, so in terms of um, guiding principles for design, and this is from the ed plan that the district has put together, um, uh, looking at a place where students, teachers, and families truly want to be. And part of that is, is developing um, a sense of uh, engagement and excitement um, and learning is authentic, meaningful, and relevant. And we know that that's a key part of your educational uh, approach. Also differentiating um, learning, um, the idea of building community and uh, within the classroom, across grade levels, within the school and across the larger Amherst community, a building that's adaptable and flexible, uh, that's going to evolve for the future, um, support learners to engage in deep thinking and, and new ways of teaching and learning that will be um, evolving over the coming uh, years and decades, and um, collaboration and sharing expertise that the building will really allow teachers to build community, to share expertise uh, and best practices. So those are some of the guiding principles that have been created. And now we're gonna give you an opportunity to share what your priorities are, but I wanted to review some of the priorities that have been uh, brought to the fore thus far. So we're gonna be looking at three different levels of priorities. First, educational priorities, then architectural priorities, 
and then community priorities. Now, they're all very much connected, we know that, but it's helpful um, sometimes to really kind of focus on them individually when we're going through this process. So in terms of things that have been prioritized um, by the district and by um, in, within the various contexts um, uh, of, of meetings and, and workshops, support for 21st century learning. We know that social justice and diversity programming is incredibly important. Um, interdisciplinary approaches, equitable access, uh, which is like universal design for learning. Dual language program, we know that that program is growing at Fort River. Um, it's an important part of, of this, of this um, uh, program that we're envisioning. Social emotional learning and restorative practices, how do we create a sense of that connectivity that really supports kids belonging and uh, feeling a sense of ownership. Supporting project-based and student-centered learning, extended learning beyond the classroom, so everywhere can become a learning station. Um, maker spaces and areas for hands-on programming, arts and enrichment, and um, storage. We, a lot of teachers are, are and very rightly so, um, really concerned about storage. So um, we'll open up now for you all to use the Mentimeter. It's the same, same code, um, uh, sharing what your top educational priorities are. Now, I'll just say that we're gonna be getting to the architectural priorities in the next slide. So if you, for instance, are sharing, um, if there's a temptation to share kind of the physical as aspects of this as opposed to the educational. So if you're thinking about collaborative learning, we want to talk about collaborative learning, not, not so much collaborative spaces, at least in this particular um, uh, um, exercise. So we really want to be thinking about what are your educational priorities for, for students um, at, at uh, Amherst Elementary School? And you can submit as many, um, as many priorities as you like. Okay, so special education programs are offered at both the combined school and at Crocker Farm, a focus on interdisciplinary learning, project-based, equitable and inclusive access, a flexible program. Caminante has expanded uh, to three classes per grade and some Spanish instruction offered to all, a building that doesn't feel like a prison. We're very much around um, buildings that are, feel non-institutional, but are also very secure, um, an expanded language program, collaboration spaces, arts and instruction, uh, curricular equity across all schools, including district-wide special education language, et cetera. Um, and, we, and we know that that equity is a, is a huge part of this conversation and very much on people's minds. Um, focus on experiential learning, Climate change curriculum um, is facilitated by the building design. Yeah, we'll talk about the building itself as a teacher, um, as connected to passive and active sustainability measures. STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So kind of integrated approach to hands-on learning um, and meeting the needs of diverse learners. Great. And again, I would, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I would open up for anybody to just turn off their or turn on their mic and share anything that you're particularly excited about. Um, it's always nice to hear people's voices, but we will have opportunity to get into some smaller groups a little bit later um, in this workshop. All right, so we're going to shift to architectural priorities now, and I'll share some of the ones that have been developed thus far and ask you to, um, to share yours, uh, which may connect to these. So definitely an inspiring space, a warm space, non-institutional. When we talk about universal design for learning, all kinds of learning is supported. So we, we need quiet spaces as well as noisy interactive spaces, um, very flexible, practical and comfortable, being safe at the same time as welcoming. Um, kids really feel, and teachers and uh, administrators feel a sense of belonging. Um, we want to be thinking about multi-use opportunities and flexible space, 
and um, the ability to build smaller levels of community and larger connection to the whole. Um, space, again, for all kinds of learning and display spaces, posting student work, and room to expand if that's, if that's needed. So we'll ask now for you all to share what your architectural priorities are as you think about uh, this renovated or new school building. Excuse me, David. Yes. Where I would it be? Hi, Jennifer Shaw here. Where would it be appropriate to share um, uh, thoughts about um, priorities concerning green energy and sustainability? Would that be appropriate here in architectural or in community? Yes, I think so. Here? Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, both. I mean, it's all as, it's all connected. But okay. yes. Thank you. Oh, Allison, I'm just seeing your message in the chat right now. Have you been able to access? Um, okay, great, thanks. Okay, so outdoor learning spaces, we definitely learned a lot about that in the last few years, the importance, and we've been thinking well before that about how to really maximize use of site and connect learning to the outdoors, both formal and informal. Um, flexible spaces that are part of the community. We always think about a community core and spaces that can be locked off, blocked off from the rest of the building for after hours and, and weekend use. We're really looking at buildings as community centers, school buildings, um, safe entry, reading and gatekeeping and but but also doing it in a way where there you see, you can easily see who's entering the school and control that um, plus there are all sorts of um, other more active measures that we can take around security um, building that honors the work of teachers and students great green energy and sustainability um, yes not outdated by sustainability standards in five to 10 years, which is always the challenge because things are evolving so quickly. But yes, that's that's we, we understand that we are, we're looking towards net zero um, school that is a source of pride, um, lots of daylight. Um, we know how how important daylight is actually in terms of a sense of well-being and it affects student performance. Um, bright and engaging spaces, organic flow. Great. Artwork and color throughout. Uh, measurable objectives for all systems. Okay, yeah. Um, now, in terms of systems, the, uh, the whole idea of using the building itself as a teacher, we can show you examples of buildings where students can interact with the, the, the passive and active, the, the active measures, the systems within the building and monitor energy usage throughout the day. Um, and really make that part of the curriculum. Some proactive spacing options for future viruses. Yeah, so we're definitely thinking about um, the, the whole approach to using every square inch of the building as a teaching and learning space, and which, which is so much easier to do now that we're every, everything is gonna be fully wired and we'll have a robust technology infrastructure. Um, that also is very kind of um, social distancing friendly uh, that approach because it really allows people to spread out through the building. Um, adaptable, easy to maintain, um, and gym, being able to enter the gym for community use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's true for any of the big ticket spaces like the cafetorium or the, the media center, the library media center, um, or if you have something like a STEAM lab um, uh, or a STEM lab uh, or some of your classrooms, we can, we can create areas in the building that can be safely accessed and blocked off from the rest of the school. Daylight at the highest levels of, of chips and that uh, chips are great for classrooms, definitely. Uh, we oftentimes look at um, light shelves that kind of like bounce light and diffuse it throughout the, um, the classroom and, um, and put the lights on sensors so you barely ever have, have to use them. Okay, climate resiliency hub for the town. All right, great. 
One more here um, in terms of looking at community priorities. Um, so the community priorities um, that have been discussed are around that safe community use and access to especially to those multi use spaces. And I will say that some districts, you know, a cafetorium um, is going to be a very nice space with a full stage and um, and audio visual those spaces oftentimes are rented out by the district as a as a resource generating uh, mechanism as well. Um, but also for use by the community. Um, so family and community engagement has been highlighted, establishment of really clear goals and community support. We've already talked about that, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it more. Um, connecting related service providers and providing spaces for them, and environmental sustainable building, uh, and the building itself as a teacher. So this has already been uh, uh, sort of highlighted as priorities. But I'll let you weigh in now with uh, with your community priorities. So community areas that are easily accessible, safely accessible after hours. Yeah, looking at the school as an emergency shelter site, um, definitely something we'll be thinking about. Um, summer programs, library, cafetorium, art, music spaces. These are all the kinds of spaces that we would that we would make available um, for after hours use. And we part of that also we're thinking about before school and after school programming as well and making sure that we're fully supporting those programs. Thinking carefully about what the existing school site that is not chosen can be best used for, and that's definitely connected to sustainability as well, um, and other other needs that you have within the community. Mm -hmm. Being mindful of the many other infrastructure budgetary needs of the town, including Crocker Farm, um, and really keeping an eye on budget for the project. Um, budget conscious spaces for family events and programming, large and vibrant library, excuse me, available to families and communities. Um, yeah, we look at the library media center as a multi-purpose space that um, really accommodates lots of um, both, both more focused and quiet learning, but also collaborative uh, space. Building to enable expansion. Uh, if the elementary school population grows, a building that everyone can be proud of, even if it's not their personal perfect, great, and a model for the community. All right. So I'm going to move on now um, to one more section, and then we're going to take a break. Um, this uh, here, I wanted to share with you um, some thoughts about what we might call future ready teaching and learning or 21st century teaching and learning. It's really about what that means to you as a district and you within your schools. Um, we know that multiculturalism um, is and equity are incredibly important um, to your district and making sure that each student is fully respected and learns to respect others. Um, so that connects to the district um, in its education plan also created a set of future ready learning goals and um, and these connect to ideas about um, empathy and citizenship and ethics right up at the top, um, students developing self-awareness, being able to see other people's perspectives, 
um, curiosity, creativity, and risk-taking, uh, collaboration, cultural awareness and expression, and effective communication. So this really aligns, these very much align with, um, just wanted to point out uh, what we call the five C's, and this was created by the Partnership for 21st Century um, Skills 20 years ago, and or 22 years ago, and um, these are higher order thinking skills that lots of schools are thinking about, and um, they're, they're very much part of the dialogue and the lexicon within schools. They're baked into next gen MCAS, they're baked into next gen science standards. It's all about um, looking at being able to apply the, the, the curriculum that you're learning to authentic situations and understand um, how they connect to um, uh, real world and your life. And, uh, and about developing confidence in yourself as a learner. And this also aligns with just a general trend towards um, educational delivery, becoming more student-centric and active, uh, flexible learning environments where technology is one-to-one, -one, if not more, and collaborative and project-based approaches that complement um, the, the more traditional approaches that of course still, still go on. And this all connects to skills for, um, for uh, success in college career work. And these are, so that these top 10 skills defined by the World Economic Forum um, are all versions of those five Cs and higher order thinking skills. So I wanted to though focus on some of the, um, the program elements that have, been, um, that have been prioritized by the district and I'm gonna go through them quite, quite quickly. We're going to make this um, presentation available on the website, um, along with all the notes from um, from this conversation and others. But of course, so social justice and multiculturalism right up at the top, um, and climate justice as connected to that. Um, your schools have core values and mission, and actually, a, a lot of these really connect to ideas about how space can be organized to help create community and help create a sense um, of connectivity and belonging. Um, universal design for learning, we're always thinking about how can we create learning environments that are gonna support uh, varied delivery methods, including hands-on, more active learning, opportunities for movement, and opportunities for students to represent and express what they know and are learning in different ways. This connects to the idea of uh, differentiated uh, in quest, uh, I have a, okay, uh, live transcription, sure. I'll enable the live transcription. Uh, sorry, and or thanks for making that request, whoever did, and I'll, I'll make sure in the next, uh, in the next uh, conversation or workshop that we have that it's on. Um, so differentiated instruction has to do with tiered intervention and an approach to making sure that you're meeting all kids where they're at and, um, and doing targeted intervention. This also connects to uh, enrichment opportunities for students. We know that dual language programming started in 2019 uh, with your kindergarten and it's growing each grade. We know it's an incredibly popular program within the district um, and an exciting one. And we wanna be talking about how to best support that. Social emotional learning is something very important to the district connecting to the idea of growth mindset, students developing um, their relationship skills, a sense of self-awareness, making responsible decisions, and restorative justice practices, uh, which are taking place in each of your schools are, are very much connected to that. Fully engaging the family and community um, in terms of parental involvement, uh, family resources and outreach, providing um, opportunities for families to um, have access to services uh, in the community, and also leveraging the, the, the great things that are going on in the Amherst community to make sure that students are connected to them. That connects to the idea of relevant and engaged learning and real world contexts, um, applying learning, uh, doing, uh, taking an approach towards authentic assessment. Uh, when students are doing more project-based work, uh, they're creating products, and, um, and so performance-based assessment is a big part of that. Uh, it also has a lot to do with connecting to the community because the community itself becomes the text. 
health and wellness, very important in terms of opportunities for movement, uh, varied context for learning, age appropriate uh, play opportunities, fitness opportunities, and connections to the outdoors. Now STEM and STEAM, lots of schools um, like, like yours, uh, like lots of districts are thinking about how to incorporate this kind of integrated approach. STEAM is that science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Uh, where art also connects to the humanities. And so it's really a multi-disciplinary uh, kind of integrated approach, kind of like a humanities approach um, or, a, or um, to, to, to learning about things like the design thinking process, engineering design, uh, problem solving. And it's a very engaging thing for students. Now the MSBA has within its template an STE, a science technology engineering uh, space within it and how we define that um, will be part of the conversation. And we know lastly, that you have your integrated arts initiative and that this connects to um, a wider kind of um, approach to really integrating creative expression and communication into your programming. So those are the things that again, in your ed plan have been, um, have been highlighted and uh, as focus areas that are really important to the district and that need to be supported in the school. So we're, we have a meant to be in your slide now where not that all of these are, might not be important to you, but we're interested for you to uh, rate the following focus areas that are most important to you. And we're gonna see kind of a graph take shape here um, as people respond. Uh, and um, it's always interesting to, to see what floats to the top here. And again, I'll just open up if anybody would like to share any of their thoughts. Um, now, I have another slide um, that's coming up right after this about anything that maybe you didn't see so far that is a particular concern for you or interest for you in terms of educational programming. Um, so you'll be able to add that. But um, I can certainly open up for anybody to share any ideas about things that you are particularly passionate about within in, in related to the educational focus of the district or um, areas that you think are important to focus on. Well, it's like social justice and multiculturalism uh, and that kind of integrated project-based approach, which is connected to STEM and STEAM are all kind of right up at the top. And they're all, they're all actually really connected too because many of the STEM and STEAM projects that I've seen that are most engaging are really connected to social justice issues. I, can I make a comment? Yes. I think we cannot take too much out of these responses. These are 11 responses out of a district of 1100 students. Mm -hmm. So these are the covariates of the 11 people that are here to answer, but there are 1,100 people. I think something like this should be done district-wide and with much more participation. This cannot be taken as a, a conclusion and these are the values of Amherst because this is only representing 11 sure. parents. Yeah, point well taken. I mean, we're, we're, we're gonna be 
offering this this conversation again um and we'll be talking to teachers about it as well we're, we're 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 seeing what are the commonalities in people's responses but that's something that perhaps the district can consider uh, mike in terms of making something like this available to the larger district as a um, in the some kind of questionnaire that we can put together thank you I would also like to share, this is Donna, um, that I think David said at the beginning, we'll be posting this um, presentation on their website and also allowing people an opportunity to respond as well. So for those that might not be able to make it this morning, that they'll have an opportunity to provide their input as well. I think it has to be clear that this is the number of responses is here. It's clear and upfront whenever the information and things it has to be okay these were 14 active participants right fair but yeah. i think they has to be upfront because if not the message that you transmit is very different oh we had this outreach and we have these responses but if you have to look at the fine print to find the 14 responses it's very different they say okay we had 14 participants this were their, their responses yeah understand. it's a very if a very different message yeah It'll be interesting to see if it shifts when, when we have more participants, right? It could be just who, who's on the call versus other folks with different needs. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, apropos to that, um, if people could add any other focus areas and priorities that are important to you that might be missing from, from this list. an interactive climate change curriculum. Mm -hmm. Internet safety, promoting equity and community for both monolingual and dual language learners. And spaces that overlap all curriculums and connect those students. Outdoor space. Uh, and farm, so okay, and uh, connected maybe to that climate change curriculum. Preparing students to participate in the democracy as opposed to in the economy. Mm -hmm. Internet safety and creative outdoor spaces. Right. Um, so we're going to take a break now. It's just about 930. We're going to take a 15 minute break and come back um, at 945 and dive into a discussion of, um, of uh, spatial attributes. And um, so, uh, but I'm going to leave this slide up here. So if anybody wants to add more uh, to this, feel free to do so. Okay, so um, and I can also, um, we can also, we'll be here waiting. If anyone has any questions um, that they'd like to ask, we can also use this time to do that. And if not, we will see you back here at, uh, at 9.45.
Okay, we're gonna make our way back here in the next minute or two and get started again. Okay, we're going to get started again, and I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> and what we're going to talk about now is we're going to, um, we've talked about some of the educational priorities um, that have been emerging, and, and now we're going to um, talk about some of the design priorities that have been discussed and ask for your feedback on them. Um, we're gonna do this in a number of ways. So, um, so in terms of what, what are design patterns? Well, they're just design approaches that we can think about as we approach the design of a building that will hopefully last for a long time and uh, provide a flexible um, and uh, cost-effective environment. And so we're going to share a bunch of examples of schools that have been designed and built within the last five years, mostly in Massachusetts, mostly through the MSBA process, and, um, and ask for your immediate feedback on them. We're going to be getting into small groups um, uh, to discuss them and to actually prioritize them. So what I'm going to share is 20 design approaches or uh, design priorities that have already been um, discussed within the, uh, the district's education plan as important for the design of this uh, Amherst Elementary School. Um, and it's a lot about sort of defining a common language about what's possible and what's desirable. Um, so we're going to continue to use Mentee to give feedback on these slides as we move through them. And um, I'm going to share, as I said, 20 different design patterns and on each slide, you're going to be able to, in the lower corner, just give us your immediate response, um, a heart if you really love it, as you think about the needs of the school community, a thumbs up if you think it's a great idea, a thumbs down if not so much, no, not important for us, or a question mark um, as to, well, you kind of need more information about it, okay? And then after every seven slides, I'm going to stop and we can do a rating again. But really, you're going to have an opportunity to discuss these in your small groups um, and, and to talk about them in, in some more depth. And those will be facilitated by our architectural design team. So and a lot of these are really, you know, kind of just things that are good, sensible approaches to design. Um, so starting with welcoming arrival, this includes safe drop off and pick up. We really need to think about that whole arrival sequence. Um, but some of the things that go into a welcoming arrival is, um, uh, is it easy to find where the entry to the building is? Um, is there a place um, to get out of inclement weather, say the doors are locked, but you're waiting to get in? Um, things like that. Are there areas outside where parents and students can gather and talk? Um, so I would just encourage people um, to respond to the slides in the lower right-hand corner um, if you're so moved. Um, if you if these are things that are important to you or you'd like to see um, in a renovated or new building. David, uh, yes. can Bruce. I make a question here? Yeah. Um, I'm immediately confused as to whether I'm uh, saying thumbs up or down to the actual image or whether I'm saying thumbs up or down to the proposition that a welcoming arrival. All right. Thank, thank you, Bruce. For, yeah, thank you, Bruce, for pointing that out. Um, it's not the image, and actually, I often have a slide that says it's not. It's not the image. It's really the idea. Um, welcome arrival, safe drop off and pick up. We're showing you a couple of examples. This is not to say, hey, I love that building. I want our new school to look like that building. It's this is um, 
This is an idea that will, can be incorporated into any aesthetic, into a renovated or a new building, um, and can take many different shapes. But just the concept of uh, we have safe drop off and pick up and a welcoming arrival sequence. Thank you for, um, for highlighting that, Bruce, right at the beginning here. I think that uh, is important for people to understand. So and so that, David, I have a question. Shouldn't yeah. the be a given? So I'm asking a question, a safe drop of pickup, I take it as a given yes, for any a school, in, in, in any school project. Particularly, we are in a rural town, we are not limited by uh, streets and so on. So I'm, yeah. I wonder, if this even should be asked. Yeah, well, uh, again, good point as well. Many of these are givens, but we're just trying to share these ideas with people and, and just get you, show you what's possible, get people excited about what's possible and what will be a focus area. So um, yeah, I, that's point well taken. I think some of these things aren't as much givens so let's go through them and, um, and we'll see where we end up. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to discuss uh, these in your, in your smaller groups. David, uh, sorry, David, just real quick. And, yeah. and none of these are mutually exclusive, right? All of these could be equally important to everyone. So. Um, exactly, there many of them are very connected actually. I mean, more what we're trying to do here is just show these are the considerations. These have already been established as priorities for, for the job, um, but we mostly wanted to share them with in this community context um, and just give people an opportunity to respond to them. Okay. Um, but in your small groups, what you're going to be doing is prioritizing the things that uh, are, are most relevant, you think, for um, for this particular context. So, so reading and gatekeeping. So, so David, I have a question. Shouldn't be in other projects I was involved, shouldn't be some, some things are non-starters. This has to be there, right? So there's no discussion about those things. And then yeah. there are other things that they have discussions like greeting and gatekeeping is a non-starter. Safety is a non-starter. Safe drop-off should be a, a non-starter. It has to be there. Mm -hmm. There's not even question about discussing. Yeah. Mike, you had you raised your hand. Yeah, so I just share my perspective is that I think uh, hopefully folks on the call feel inspired by seeing some of these images and being able to imagine what a school is. I know we have a bunch of architects on the call for them. Maybe this is this is uh, oh obvious, but for most people like me, um, we could talk about grading and gatekeeping. And until I actually see what it could look like, I only know what I know, which is my past experience. So, you know, I think another frame for this part of the workshop could be an opportunity to see some images of greeting gatekeeping. I'm just doing that one because up, but different design patterns so that it can inform the feedback that we offer the architectural team here. Um, you know, unless you're a licensed architect or study this, you may not have examples other than buildings you've been in, which is for many people likely limited to the buildings that their children go to, uh, which in our instance is almost never uh, the top end design uh, because none of our schools really meet that. Uh, in our district. So I think, you know, my advice to people on the call is to take, you know, there's different parts of the activity that you can gather from it. And uh, I think in terms of the feedback you offer, I think there's a number of different ways you can take the information in and be able to offer feedback to the design team, not just today, but over time as well. Thanks, Mike. So <clears throat> uh, Jennifer? I just wanted to I just wanted to say, in case anyone struggled at first as I did, that we're clicking on the icon in Menti, not in not in the Zoom. Like you have to oh, go to the Menti window you, to click yes, on. The you icon. have to go to the Menti dialog box to do that. Thank you, Jennifer, um, for clarifying that. So yes, I mean, I think we can look at this as we're trying to share concepts that are approaches that have been suggested for the school, and we want to make sure that people are aware of them. And if to the extent that you um, are particularly excited and we, we'd like to see what rises to the top in terms of yeah this this is really something that we want to see in the school so um, so in terms of greeting and gatekeeping um, you know might there be a friendly face when you first arrive um, in this situation at the Cabot school on the right you can see it, it completely opens up that's unlike some situations in schools where you have to enter into the office um, also, part of this whole function is that 
uh, when you enter the school, do you have a sense of where to go and how to move around? Oftentimes, it's hard to even find the main office in a, in a school. So in this situation at the service school on the left, we see the cafetorium, we see a notice board with an LCD panel right next to the office, uh, lots of transparency there. Flexible classrooms and spaces. And again, we just wanna show you what these look like. So we can see examples with uh, modular furniture uh, that can be um, easily rearranged for more individual or group work. We see storage, uh, we see sinks. Uh, there's uh, robust technology. On the left-hand side at the Jacobs School in New Bedford, you can see this particular classroom has a movable wall between that and an adjacent classroom. Uh, that's also a whiteboard to allow for um, allow for that kind of team teaching that's important to them. There's also a nook uh, in the classroom um, where students can do more quiet work and get comfortable, but they're still easily uh, uh, supervised. And here we see what's called a light shelf where the light is reflected off of the ceiling to diffuse light and give natural light throughout. Classroom neighborhoods. Now, this is one of those things that is not necessarily a given, um, but it's an approach to getting flexible relationships between classrooms. And these be, could be considered as grade level neighborhoods or grade bands. You might have a couple of, of grades that would be connected. Um, this is no more square footage, but what we've done is you, you can see here in this plan at the service school in Newton, there's no, it's a hallway, but it's also a usable space as a flexible project-based learning space. You can also see that there's quite a lot of transparency um, into these spaces uh, and between classrooms so that you can send students out. They can work more independently, but you can still closely uh, supervise and monitor them. So this is a way to maximize the use of the square footage in the building. In this particular neighborhood, which is a grade level neighborhood, you also have a small group room and a pullout space where intervention and enrichment work can happen or small group meeting, or it could be a de-escalation space. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. And this is an approach that we see a lot of schools um, taking to try and build in that flexibility and variety of space. I will say here, because I know we're concerned about security. Um, these these uh, doors and windows have blind, the, the windows have blinds that come down in the case of a lockdown situation. There are areas of refuge within um, the classrooms that are that are shown by floor patterns on the classroom. So as part of their um, as part of their lockdown procedure, students go to those areas of refuge. Extended learning environments, this is really about uh, looking at spaces that might otherwise have been a hallway um, uh, to create extended learning opportunities where small group work can happen um, and, um, and where, again, you might have transparency so that you can see, um, see students and help to monitor them. It helps students build more independence, but it also gives the opportunity in a situation where you're doing more kind of station-based um, uh, delivery that um, some groups can spread out. And it just also is using the square footage of the school uh, in a, in a um, more effective way. Wayfinding and streetscapes, um, using color, pattern, graphics to be able to allow people to move through the space um, in easy ways. Uh, this has a lot to do with the idea of universal design. Um, where it's very clear how you move through the space, um, where there's a sense of connectivity. It also has to do with making buildings feel non-institutional, where there's a sense of place and space. So as you're moving through, you might see adults meeting, you might see the steam room, you might see the music room. STEM, STEAM, and maker spaces. Some schools have particular STEM programs that are very robust. Um, here at the Jacobs Elementary School, there's a garage door that goes right outside to a deck outside um, that allows learning to happen. There's uh, weather stations, there's planters, um, but this is part of their program. Um, all students go through their Spark Lab space uh, twice a week. At the Beverly Middle School, um, all of the classroom neighborhoods have their own 
hands-on project space that they call their maker space for more hands-on work and also for integrated uh, delivery if you want to bring two classrooms together. Excuse me, David. Mm -hmm. um, there is a comment from Tony that maybe you can address because they, uh, you, we as architects love to start talking about the building and, yeah. and these patterns, but we want to relate them all back to the program. So if you could just take a minute. Um, so what is the comment? The uh, sorry, I'll just open up the chat. Uh, if you go to the chat, right? Yeah. Well, hi, Tony. So yeah, so I mean, they are really about design because we're we're getting into discussions of, of design and, and how that connects to the program. Um, we have a pretty clear understanding of the of the district's programs as outlined in the educational plan. Um, and so we're these definitely um, connect to how are these programs going to be delivered and what are the spaces that are going to best support them. For instance, a social justice curriculum or the idea of um, students as democratic citizens as part of a school community, um, space really can affect that in terms of how you articulate these small learning communities as connected to the larger whole. Um, also um, thinking about your, um, your sustainability curriculum and opportunities for hands-on and project-based learning. These spaces really connect to ideas about, um, about how that might look in practice. So what we're trying to do is, is connect those educational um, uh, priorities and directives to ideas about space because we're going to have to get to those um, relatively quickly. Does that, does that answer your question, Tony, or would you like to um, pose any more? Yeah, if I may. I, I yeah. understood this um, visioning workshop to be about the educational program and what we want to see in elementary education in Amherst in the future. I didn't realize the plan was already written. In no, that the plan is not written. These are, these are puzzle pieces. These are approaches to space. Um, nothing has been put on paper. Um, these are ideas about, you know, what resonates with the community and with the school community uh, to support the educational program that you are articulating. So it's all an iterative process. Um, but, but we, you know, people like to, uh, I think for some people, they need visual kind of connectivity to understand, well, what, how would this even, how would these educational programs even be supported by a different kind of building? And that's the other thing we're trying to do in this is show you best practice examples of what the MSBA has supported in the last five years and get people excited about what's possible in terms of um, in terms of how space can be used. But there's these are not these are there's nothing that's been put on paper um, uh, about any of these. Um, they're they're just ideas about what's what are priorities, just as we're talking about educational priorities. We want to articulate architectural priorities. So, um, all right. So I'm going to keep moving on here because uh, I want to give us time to get into our small groups. So um, I've got uh, another another 14 of these or so. Um, so I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. So we have time if, to if, if I yeah, yeah I, if I may. Hi, this is. Yeah. Marie. Picky. Hi. Um, Hi. And yeah, I think it would be great to kind of go through these quickly because um, I'm going to speak for myself, but I think that this is uh, a feeling that's shared by many um, is that as Bruce had said, there's a lot of non-negotiables and there's a lot of things that I think we can all agree on. And that's kind of not the, I, I don't know that that's where we want to be spending our time where there are a lot of issues that are controversial that are not known to a lot of the public that we don't have agreement on that relates specifically to the educational programming. So I'm hoping that we really focus on those issues um, and start to address those here and, and in other forums before the educational program um, is, uh, is written. Is, is written. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and we were we we're trying to get to that at the um, at the beginning of the of this conversation, but maybe didn't didn't open enough for an, enough time for some of those issues to come out. Um, Michael, I'm gonna I'm gonna look to you right now to to see to ask your 
opinion about how we might most effectively uh, use the time in this meeting. Um, I really want to honor people's, um, you know, sort of what they're, what's most important to them and what they're, what they're thinking about. We could certainly open up for a conversation about that. I can go through these quickly. Um, and then just to just to give people a sense of what's what's involved and maybe perhaps instead of um, getting into those small groups to talk about um, to talk about these design patterns, we could we could talk about some of the outstanding issues that people are most concerned about and make sure that we have those recorded. Yeah, whatever's going to work for the group. I mean, I think it's hard to know. Uh, you know, I see other comments coming in too, and I see other hands going up. Um, you do this, you know. You do this in a lot of communities, David. So I, I want to defer to you in in some ways uh, about the best way to gather feedback. Um, but I also see three hands up that I want to let folks weigh in on that. Okay, so, so um, people, I, a couple of people are saying they appreciate the design elements. I think what we'll do is, um, yeah, I do do this with a lot of communities. Um, I I think let's move through these images and let's get into our small groups and we can make the small group discussion as much a discussion about what are some of the outstanding educational issues as 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 well as what people are most excited about in terms of uh in terms of design priorities so uh, maybe we can we can do that uh steve you had your hand up you good okay great all right so i think that uh, we can open up for, you know, we can make that conversation in our small groups, uh, give it a focus um, that is not just uh, on design. Um, um, sorry, and, David, uh, Katie yeah. had her hand up as well. Yes. Thank you, okay. just a quick, can you all yeah. hear me? Yes. Just a quick uh, clarifying question. Um, and I'm sorry, cause I'm in and out today given my own work schedule, but um, in terms of the educational plan, I, I missed that portion. So I'm wondering, for example, am I voting for these ideas based on the fact that, for example, like is this new school housing um, the dual language program, right? Because something like that, that information is therefore going to influence how I vote for these design patterns, if that makes sense. Right, right. Um... Well, Katie, so this has been recorded, so um, you will be able to access the beginning part of that. We did talk about the dual language programming as, as certainly a priority for, um, for the, uh, um, the, the district, and the thought is that this school would house the dual language program within it. Um, and then there are you know, a lot of other elements in terms of the architectural piece that we that we covered this same, we're gonna do some version of this same thing. Maybe it will be modified slightly um, on the 26th. Okay, um, I'll catch uh, that one in, then in the evening. So, Thank you. But we'll also be putting all these notes together um, and making them accessible on the website. If it, can I say yeah. one thing that that may, may help, may not help, um, but uh, I think one of the things to think about, and this is a really hard thing uh, for people on my line of work, it's probably a, large, a really hard thing for people on the call is that we're looking for this building to last for 50 years. So I think there are things like the dual language program, which David just talked about, which is planned to be part of the new building. Uh, it's also the case that, can I tell you what in 2070 our program is going to look like? I cannot. And so I think for me, a critical component, and this was kind of loosely talked about is, what's the ability to be flexible with the design, right? So we can, we can plan a school for 2026. Uh, what we know in this district is by 2030, there'll probably be some new thoughts and some shifts because that's what our history is in the Amherst. So uh, I don't wanna minimize the questions about 2026, but I think just shifting, you know, and this is work I've had to do because it's not how I, how I think uh, occupational hazard perhaps is that we really wanna think about the long-term as well. And, uh, you know, yes, we want it to be fabulous the first year and have the programming designed uh, in a way that does that. But we also want to think that this building is going to last a long time. And so, you know, to me, the higher order questions are sometimes less about kind of details that are 2026 based, and they're much more about 2036, 2046, and 2056. And so some of these elements that David is showing for me help me think through that uh that long-term vision of a building 
And we don't know everything about what the world will be in those years. We don't even know what the world will be right in 2023 and we're in 2022. Um, but I, I think having that flexibility and durability, we know we're gonna have an entrance. We know we're gonna, you know, I think we're gonna want collaborative learning environments, maybe, maybe not. And, and those are the things that, that I think really matter. As David started the meeting, he talked about kind of higher order uh, kind of uh, analysis that we're doing here. And that's not to suggest that Katie's question is not a good one. It's critical about the dual language program, but I think we have to hold both of those things in order that one, we, we, we wanna sort out exactly what it looks like in 2026, but we don't wanna be in a place in 2036 where we look back and say, oh my God, they didn't think of this. And now we can't make our programming work. Um, and so I just would encourage all of us to hold both of those. We need things to work in 2026 and have things figured out, but we also need it to be flexible and durable for a future that we can't fully predict. Yeah, thanks for that, Mike. Um, yeah, we're definitely looking at buildings as performing a lot of different functions than, than traditional schools did not. Uh, traditional schools were often a collection of um, classrooms, certainly still the basic building block of any school, uh, but they were located along very institutionalized corridors and not much connectivity between them. So we know we're, we're looking to really spread learning out throughout the school to look at every inch of the school um, as a learn, teaching and learning station, potentially anywhere, anytime learning. That connects to the idea of fully wired spaces. And it also connects to the idea of students learning more independently and doing more um, sort of being more proactive as learners. And we start that in very early grades. So those are some of the themes that come up here and it really is also connected to making a very practical and cost-effective building. So um, I'm gonna keep going with these um, and, uh, and then we're going to get into our smaller group. So um, collaborative environments, yes, lots of schools are thinking about collaborative environments. We can think about how does a school uh, gathering take place in formal or more informal ways, um, but also how does the learning get extended beyond the classroom walls in this situation here you can see that there's there's lots of visual kind of supervision that's going on of these spaces that are now what they did is they took some of the library space and they put that square footage throughout the building and curated collections of books close to grade levels um, that could be used by those um, uh, by those teachers and students. So that's one way that we can think creatively also um, about, about using the square footage uh, within the building. Um, in addition to collaborative environments, or another one is the cafetorium. The MSBA will not fund an auditorium in elementary schools. Um, you could do an either cafetorium or a gymnatorium. Most schools opt for a cafetorium, uh, given the flexibility around scheduling. But this also becomes a really potentially very attractive multi-purpose space. We think a lot about, um, about uh, acoustics now, having a full stage with lighting and sound um, and a space where multi-purpose events can take place. Um, and we also look at the cafeteria as much more than just food service at this point. It's a, it's a, it's a place where learning can happen uh, when, when um, food service is not happening. Uh, so flexible furniture within that environment as well is really important. Uh, the idea of history and storytelling, um, we can see examples, um, especially in newer buildings where people, communities want to make reference uh, to their older buildings or their legacy uh, or the history of the community. So we can think about how that takes place uh, within the building. But that also has to do with not just things on the walls, but things that you're seeing. Um, and, um, and so here in the school, you can see that the steam room has what we call a nano wall that just opens it directly up to a main circulation area within the school and it becomes very visible. You can open up into that space also for more extended learning. Um, display and exhibition uh, is a big part of celebrating student learning. And um, uh, we wanna support 2D and 3D display, more informal and formal displays. Oftentimes we see uh, these large screen monitors that where you can have ongoing kind of um, uh, presentations that showcase student work. And uh, gathering hubs and presentation spaces, oftentimes the library media center is a place 
where that can happen. That's also a place where, uh, where professional development can happen um, within the school. And we wanna see that space as uh, highly flexible. And within the MSBA template, there's room for breakout and what the, we call pullover spaces. These could be in close proximity to classrooms. They could be in extended areas of the hallway. They could be enclosed or they could not be, um, but they're areas where that small group work or intervention or enrichment can happen. Um, having them in close proximity to the classrooms allows you um, to have build in that variety of spaces that the teachers and students can access. So we'll just uh, quickly let people weigh in here. Okay, collaborative environments right up at the top. Now, interestingly, you have all been living and, and working in, uh, in these open plan spaces that have been really problematic uh, for you. Um, a lot of the qualities of the spaces that I'm sharing right now have an ability to be open, but and may have connectivity and transparency, but they also can be closed off because, uh, because acoustics are so important in terms of conversation. So, uh, or in, in terms of um, being able to, uh, to focus. And so, so a lot of the more open environments that we're, that we're showing, it's important to understand that they can all be closed off and they have floor to wall, uh, uh, floor to ceiling walls. All right, last set here, Innovation Hub. This connects to the idea of, um, of, uh, of being able to co-locate uh, spaces um, that are might create that community core. So here at the Bourne uh, Elementary School, um, we see that the art room, the innovation studio or STEM area, uh, the, the learning commons, which is their library media commons, and an outdoor classroom and the music room are all co-located so as to be able to create an innovation hub that can also be accessible to the community. Um, so it's just one way that we think about making these amenities also centrally located um, so that if you have teaching neighborhoods, uh, we're really trying to minimize the amount of travel in the school. So oftentimes we're trying to really centrally locate these core uh, amenities so that they then students from classrooms that are around sort of the perimeter um, of these core services don't have to travel far to get there. And they also go a long way to creating a sense of connected community. Media Center Learning Commons um, is really, a, a, again, often looked at as the hub of the school. We wanna make sure that there are areas for, um, for quiet work as well as for more interactive and collaborative work. This also might be where you have your STEM lab uh, or STEAM uh, studio or, uh, or breakout rooms as well to give more flexibility to that space. The idea of distributed resources. Uh, this is one of the high tech high network uh, schools in San Diego. You can see all of these green areas here in this plan are offices or meeting rooms. Um, and so as students travel through this school, the adults are spread throughout. So there's a set of adult eyes that are, um, that are on, you, on students at all times, which actually gives them a lot of autonomy. They don't need um, passes to go to the bathroom. Uh, there is a strong sense of knowing and being known that students have. But this is really, um, uh, again, this is one context of how it might look, but it's the idea of putting adults in close proximity to the students and the 
uh, the populations that they're working with. Outdoor connections, again, we're, this is one of those givens, we're certainly gonna be looking at maximizing um, your outdoor uh, spaces and use of them, uh, age appropriate play areas, um, outdoor classrooms with connectivity, internet connectivity, as well as some form of shelter from the elements. So if it's raining outside, you can still be out there. Um, so we're uh, also thinking about engaged outdoor play age appropriate. We know particularly for the lower grades, we want to have immediate access um, for the, our early childhood to outdoor environments. And sustainability, which we know is a, a key priority here in terms of your net zero approach. And these measures can be active and passive, and we can fully integrate them also into um, the design of the building in such a way that students and teachers can monitor the energy consumed within a building. And, um, or we can be talking about recycling programs. In this, in this photo on the left-hand side, you see that the systems of the building have been color-coded um, and so that students can sort of understand um, what, what these systems are doing. So this is our last set, and then we're gonna jump into our small groups. Okay, so outdoor connections and sustainability right up at the top, which uh, makes a lot of sense given our conversation thus far. All right. So in your small groups, uh, we're gonna, we're, we're actually, we're gonna allow 30 minutes within your group. Um, you're gonna have a member of the design team that will be uh, helping to uh, take notes and facilitate the conversation. Um, our thought was to, um, you have a handout and uh, I'm going to, um, actually I'm gonna put it into the chat right now. Uh, there's a handout that has all of the different, um, all of the different uh, design patterns that I just went through. And the thought was that in our small groups, we were going to, uh, access that handout and um, hold on, there we go. I just put it in the, wait a second, no, I gotta send it to the whole group. Yeah, Donna, you have your hand raised. I do, David, thank you. Um, I think what, what we were um, just listening to what I think it's Tony or some others that would like to spend a little more time talking about the actual educational goals uh, for, for, right. the, for the district that perhaps we can spend a little less time in the small group discussion and then have a larger conversation, a little more time at the end. So, so we can um, listen to those as right. well. Yeah, I was, I, had, I was thinking we would spend time in the small groups talking about that, but if it's valuable to spend time in the larger group, perhaps what we could do um, is right now uh, spend time doing that and then get into our smaller groups. We'll see where that conversation, we'll see where that conversation goes. Mike, I see you um, nodding your head. So does that make sense? And we don't have to do those smaller groups. If it's more helpful to have a larger group conversation, we can do that. And I will be um, taking notes as people are talking. We're also recording this, but, um, but I'll, I'll be sure to take notes and incorporate that. I did. I don't know if I mentioned at the very beginning that all of these, um, the findings and the feedback from um, from 
the workshops that we're doing are going to be put together in a consolidated set of notes with the highlights and they'll be on the website as well. Yeah, so. I just, I think, um, David, just to respond to doing it either in small group or with a whole group, I think with the whole group, we have um, Mike and some other educators on here that we, yeah. some, some some of us who might be facilitating the small groups wouldn't be able to respond to. So. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, great, Donna. thank you. So, yeah, and I saw Mike raise it, uh, uh, nodding his head. So I think we should open up for that conversation and then just see where it goes. And if we if we want to get into small groups, we can, or we can spend the rest of the time um, talking about these uh, considerations. Um, I did have at the at the the last fifteen minutes, um, I had planned on a, um, a you know a slide with what are the considerations and larger questions that people have. So I think that might be what what we're opening up for now around the educational program and the project itself. You're so, muted. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Kathy, you have your hand up. Um, I just, Kathy. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with where the direction we're going, but I would very much, um, as to bring back to building committee, if people with the 20 uh, pictures and options, if you have a way, David, of asking us to go back and look at the whole set, you know, after the meeting, if we're not going to do it in a small group. Okay, Kathy, that, that's fine. Um, I can certainly, um, I think Debbie Westmoreland is going to be our point of contact. Uh, we, we had her email here for any ongoing questions. I can certainly, we can provide her email as well as my email. And people upon looking at that set can get back to us and give us any feedback on it. And you could potentially create your own, your own set of priority listings for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I just, because I, I actually found it useful when we were talking about priorities, thinking how to influence space. You either create that space or you don't create that space. So I was bouncing back and forth in my mind between the educational program and the space. And so I found it very useful. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not an architect. So I'm just uh, thinking away, the kids might move through the school building. So, you know, and their experience and teachers experience. So that it's all I wanted to is capture if we're not going to be doing that during this session, figure out a way of capturing people's thoughts. That's it. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. Kathy. And I, I would like to say um, the educational program that we are submitting to MSBA does require us to address a lot of the space relationships, adjacencies, what's important to the community. So when they start looking at the layouts and the design of the building, that it does um, clearly take into consideration all of these components. And so for MSBA, it isn't just about um, the individual educational components it really is how the educational program will shape the building design and layout as well so it has a dual role so yeah, they're you. both very these are both very connected the educational uh, priorities feed directly into then what are the architectural approaches that are going to ensure that we honor those as well as the guiding principles that have been created for the job uh, really provide the lenses through which we want to look at all of these architectural options and approaches. So I see some hand reins. Well, Jennifer, do you want to oh, just, yes. you're first up on my screen, so. Thanks, Donna. Um, so I guess my right off the bat, my input is that for at least half of these 20 elements, um, my feeling is like, the, the photos are wonderful and those kids look happy, but I have no idea if, um, if, if this will work for teachers, for educators. And so I think it's critical to get input from educators as to whether this type of space will work for them. Um, I don't, and I see some teachers in the room, so that's great, but I don't think that like 
we as a group or uh, should be deciding what the layout of the building should be without that critical input from teachers. So I, I just I'm assuming that there's going to be some targeted um, discussion with educators about all of these elements so that we don't sort of dictate a layout that then doesn't work for our educators. Sure, Jennifer, uh, that will definitely happen. And it has happened in various forums because um, in in the 2015 2016 visioning that was going on there were there was 21 hours of of workshops with largely a group of educators and community representatives um, and they began prioritizing these as connected to the program and then the educational program that has been developed um, in in connection to the all each of this the elementary school improvement plans um, connects those two ideas about, about the, the kind of spaces that are needed and already outlines some of those desired adjacencies. But we'll definitely be checking in with the, the faculty around that. Um, typically, in this process, um, we engage in, in, uh, in workshops that incorporate a lot of educators along with the community members because everybody is spread so thin now, given the situation with Omicron. We thought that this would be a better approach um, to just open up for whenever people are available, but we're going to find times when uh, the faculty can um, can give their input directly. Uh, yes, Tony. Thank you. Um, so just for context, I'm the parent of a sixth grader and a third grader at Wildwood. Um, I'm not an educator, so I don't know that side of things. But I did send through a bunch of questions I had through to um, the superintendent and Ben Harrington from the school committee um, that I think are directly related to the educational program and what gets written into it. But one that I just wanted to bring up now is uh, currently there are three specialized district uh, uh, district wide specialized programs, and I'm not sure if they've been evaluated if they you know, if the people that work in those and the families that are, that are, have children in those programs, if they work, um, how they should be in the future, if they should be combined or redesigned in any way, and if they are to remain as they are right now, will they both be offered at Crocker Farm and at the new school? And, and that would play into the space summary for the MSBA, how many classrooms are needed for those programs. At both at both schools. Um, currently, they're only offered at Fort River, so children from the other two districts or the other two schools that that uh, attend them are bused away from their home district. So, personally, I think it should be a priority for the district that there is no busing for for special services going forward, and so that would mean the educational program in there would be describing those programs as being offered at both Crocker Farm and this consolidated school, and that. Like I said, it has a direct impact on the space needed. Um, and then uh, the other thing I just wanted to bring up now is Caminantes. So I know there's a bunch of families that tried to get into it, but there wasn't enough space, primarily families that have English as their, as their spoken language at home. Is there demand? Has there been an exploration of whether there is sufficient demand to open a third classroom? Is that possible with the 50-50 model? I don't know. I know now there's two classrooms. One, one is a Spanish teacher and one is an English teacher. Would it work if we were expanded to three classes per grade? Um, so ju just some questions that I think feed directly into the educational program and would directly impact the design. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, but can I jump in? Because I think they're yes, excellent please, questions. Mike, I was going to ask. Tony uh, raised some things that do. So I'll start with the latter one first. I'll go in reverse order. So for Caminantes, I don't see why it would. <clears throat> so we're presuppose. What I'm hearing in your comment is presupposing that the 575 option occurs. I think at the beginning we talked about MSBA uh, coming up with a, a new space or um, enrollment study just for Fort River. But I just, is that an accurate reflection, Tony? Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was uh, responding appropriately. So for Caminantes, uh, there's space in a 575 student school where the, there would be that flexibility. I think some of our challenges would be uh, quite honestly um, staffing. You know, it is, it's been a challenge. And as we're scaling up, you know, each grade level, it is um, Katie, who's on this call, has done incredible amounts of work to uh, work on the staffing component and curriculum. So uh, it's not something I could commit to. I don't think it, um, because I'm not, I'm not sure we could find qualified staff at that scale 
Um, hard to know what 2026 looks like, but that would be a challenge. Katie could certainly feel free to jump in if she'd like, but I think that's uh, how we'd have to do. I think the other math part of it is that if we had three of those, then that would be six Comenantes classes um, because of the way, as you described, that kids spend half the day. And so that I think would leave no space for monolingual classes unless we change the model to a one-way model, which uh, we have intentionally not gone to. Um, so I think there's also some logistical challenges of leaving space for families who opt for their children not to be part of the program. It might exhaust the seats uh, that way. So I think there's some real challenges, but I do think there's demand, uh, but not necessarily demand in a way that we might be able to offer. Um, but I don't think the space would really dictate that. That's a more, uh, over time, we could see if the staffing and the demand uh, would support that. On the special ed program piece, I'm glad you raised that. So philosophically, and I think I've been on record multiple times as saying this, that I agree with you. I don't think busing, you know, should be a part of it. I think our challenge, because we can't, this came up with one of our programs, you know, not much, not much pre-COVID about splitting the program. And what we heard directly from staff is there's incredible benefit, uh, particularly building blocks and AILC, which have more than one core teacher in them, to having combined programs uh, in terms of covering for one another, in terms of developing the needs over six or seven years of the experience. And they strongly advocated against splitting their program. Uh, and I think to Jennifer, uh, Jennifer's point a minute ago, uh, it might seem great administratively for me, uh, frankly, it would, uh, but I also want to be respectful of teachers who expressed viewpoints, for instance, things I heard were, you know, well, there's two ILC classrooms, some of that could be based on age, right, because the age span is so great at the elementary level, but some of it also is based on needs. There can be students in those programs who really are better supported not being in the same class with one another, uh, just like any other kid in any other space where sometimes those, uh, it's a little more acute because the numbers are smaller. So at this time, you know, the initial thought is to maintain the programs within the kind of existing models that we have with combined programs, more than one teacher. Based on the feedback we've heard from teachers, uh, they feel strongly it's, it better supports the students they have. Uh, we've had these conversations over the ILC and the Building Blocks program. The Ames program is a little more unique because there's only one teacher, so it's not so splittable. Um, so unless there was an infusion of resources where we could add programming uh, at Crocker Farm, uh, which I don't imagine there will be, that infusion of resources, I, I'm, I'm really loath to go against what I'm hearing directly from the educators working in the specialized programs themselves. So it's a complex issue because I don't, I'm uncomfortable with the busing too, Tony, I'm, I'm right there with you, but I also understand that folks who are working with these populations see great benefit of having uh, more than one section in the same building. And so that that's the balancing act we have. And I tend to side with the educators working as closely with the kids uh, when it's making the, that level of decision. Um, but I super appreciate both questions and they're both critical. So thank you, Tony. And um, I, Devonia, I, I don't know what your first name is. Yes, hi, it's, it's Irene. Uh, so I have a question because many of all these spaces, I think I was trying to separate the ones that are a non-starter, that they should be there and that the uh, ones yeah. that, they, that are open. And, and again, I think it has to do with the educational programming because um, most of the things, most parents would say, yes, let's go ahead, but we won't have the budget and we won't have the reimbursement from the MSBA for many of these spaces, right? Uh, so we're gonna to have to make a balance uh, educated based on the education and program, like do teachers want to gather in spaces or uh, a maker space? Yes, we would like, to, as a parent, maybe if I, my kid, I would like a maker space, but does yeah. it fit with education and programming? Um, the coll collaborative or the neighborhood classrooms, does it mean that it has to have the small breakout spaces nearby or don't they have? Are those two things sure. combined together? Is it neighborhood and small rooms next to it, or it could be non-neighborhood and small rooms? Um, yes, those things are combined. You could, I mean, neighbor, small breakout rooms are part of a neighborhood. They could be one of the pieces of a neighborhood. A neighborhood could simply be adjacent classrooms, uh, but usually we like to put in sort of some extended learning areas and some smaller group meetings and bathrooms as well that are close by. And um, just in terms be, of- just, just, just because yeah. when yeah. I see of those things, I'm thinking 
yes, this is fashionable now, but maybe it's not so much in the future. So my concern yeah. sometimes of those things is flexibility, sure. yeah. right? Yeah, just, the one just like the open classroom was fashionable in the 70s and we learned that there were a lot of problems with it. Um, so I think that the spaces have to be thought as a flexible spaces and not only for this and they can be reconfigured sure uh, and adapted in the future in an easy way yeah well yes definitely we're looking at all of the classrooms as being sort of interchangeable except if they have some special maybe if you have a stem or a steam classroom that has a few more bells and whistles but for the most part these classrooms are really interchangeable as mike said we don't know what it's going to look like 10 years from now 20 years from now so we need to allow these spaces to, to take different take on different iterations. But what I would say is that it's not kind of a trade-off between many of the spaces that you saw. All of the spaces that you saw were supported by the MSBA. Those are all MSBA jobs, or met, most of them were, some one or two of them weren't. Yeah, but, but the cost per square foot, it adds up, right, for the well, budget? Yes, yes and no, because what, what really what we're trying to do is get the biggest bang for the buck. So if you look at hallways, for instance, they take up 30% of the square footage in a, in a school, and they're not used except for between periods, or many schools use them very uncomfortably for getting having kids go out into the hallway and do work, and they're lying on the floor, and they're, you know, they're trying to make the best of um, that situation. So... But if so, what the MSBA is is concerned with, they look at your enrollment and they spit out a very thoughtful architectural program based on square footage. And it's actually quite generous in terms of square footage, in terms of what they will support. They want larger classrooms because they know that classrooms aren't just stand up and deliver. They're also kids breaking out into smaller groups. They want to support these extended learning areas if they're making good use of the space, but they want to see that within the ed plan. They want language about, well, how will you use these spaces? And they definitely are supporting um, these smaller breakout rooms because they're part of the special education square footage. And the Department of Secondary Education is going to be making sure that although you might have some occupational OT, PT, and speech you know, in one separate area of the building, that you also are supporting intervention and push in delivery. So they want that flexibility. So what we're really trying to do is look at this whole collection of spaces um, where, where the sum is greater than its parts, where you have like a real synergy between larger spaces, smaller spaces, classrooms, um, and um, but it's not about more square footage usually. I mean, so that being said, when you look at, so in an elementary school program, the classrooms can range from 850 to 950 square feet um, within the MSBA template. So there have been some schools that have said, well, we really think it's important to have these extended learning environments. So in addition to the hallway space, we're going to add we're going to say our classrooms are 900 square feet and we're going to take 50 square feet and we're going to add them to that set of classroom neighbor to that neighborhood that space does that make sense but it's all it's all about staying within the square footage and that's that's uh, and making the case for how you want to use that space and that that will and in that situation the msba will support that uh we have two more hands up um and uh, I'll start with uh, uh, M. I, I don't know your first name. Uh, sorry. It's Maria. Thank Maria. you. So um, I want to talk about a couple things specifically. One is uh, the Comandantes and language programming. I think it's going to be important that we do some specific outreach to the kids at kids and families and staff who are currently in both the multilingual, the bilingual, and the monolingual programs to ask them how things are working, what is working, what is not working um, with respect to space, what are the challenges, things that will inform what we put in our educational program and what, and what we do with design. Um, the other thing is uh, the district-wide special education. And uh, Mike, thank you for your comments. That, that's the first that I had heard about there having been any discussion with staff about centralized versus decentralized. I was on the enrollment working group that looked at this um, and we had recommended that there be a more robust 
analysis of going decentralized or centralized. Um, I think it's very important that we hear from families to find out what's working for them, what they would like to see, um, and to talk about the centralization, decentralization, whether you have these programs in all the schools or just in one school. Um, and I don't believe that that's happened. It's also important to find out from the families whether the programs as they are currently configured are serving those families adequately or do things about the programs themselves have to be changed. This is a perfect opportunity um, to look at that. The other thing to consider is that currently, Crocker Farm has about 30% of the families, the, the elementary school families in town. It's going to have more. It's going to be 40%. So there are going to be a lot more families districted to Crocker Farm than are currently. And I don't know how widespread that knowledge is, but that's going to be important to share as we talk about this building project. It's also going to come into play when we talk about programs, if they are only cited at a new consolidated school, it's gonna be important for people to know that that's going to represent less people than they originally thought. More, there are gonna be Wildwood and Crocker, and sorry, Fort River families currently who are gonna be going to Crocker instead. And, um, and I think that larger population that's gonna be at Crocker is gonna make a difference in terms of how we do some of these programs that are cited in a specific location. Um, one other thing I think we need to add to our list of important items is pandemic resiliency. We learned that, we all learned that, the whole world learned that the hard way about how we need to bring that into our planning. And we made adjustments to our current buildings to allow to, uh, to get kids back in school. So I think that has to be part of it. And Mike, I also appreciated your, your comments that we need to think about this for 50 years. Or, or even more down the line, hopefully. Um, um, but I think that cuts both ways as we've talked about, right? In the 60s and 70s, we could have had a visioning group and they would have said, open classroom design, this is what we wanna see. So, you know, the things that we're thinking now, we have to have some hubris and understand that what we think is not necessarily what's gonna be good, what, what's gonna be considered to be good 50 years down the line. Um, that's all I've got for now. Thank you. Mike, did you want to respond to that at all? Or, um... No, I, I just, you know, I appreciate the, the comments uh, that were shared. And um, yeah, I, I, don't, I think, you know, on the special ed issue, I, I think I already spoke to that. And I think maybe I'll just say in general, I think one of our challenges, and I'm so glad that folks are here because they can maybe communicate this meeting to others and talk about the next one is, mm -hmm. um, everyone's capacity is diminished right now, if I'm going to be really blunt and honest, right, is that this is a particularly challenging time. If this was happening four months ago, perhaps we would be uh, a little lighter, uh, a little more nimble. And, uh, and I'm not only speaking for myself, but I'm speaking for the larger community as well. So I think we do really have challenges. I've gotten some feedback, some critical feedback on um, the number of emails that we've sent out. Uh, granted, most of those are pandemic related, but not all. But just, you know, I think the balancing act here in terms of engagement is uh, educators, you know, families, communities are under extreme stress at the moment. And, and so I think that's, you know, it's not to say we don't want to engage, but it also is, I think, representative of the moment in time that we have. So I think, uh, you know, we did talk about some of the special ed pieces um, a couple of years ago at school committee, you know, they were talking about special ed programs. Um, so there was discussion explicitly on that topic. It's a different set of families to Maria's point, right? That changes over time. And, uh, but I also wanna be realistic about the expectations. I know Donna, to the point that Jennifer raised earlier, uh, Donna and David and I spoke the other day about doing a, another session explicitly for educators right after the school day. So just you know, trying to create as many opportunities for feedback as we can get. And knowing that at this point, people who are incredibly invested in this process uh, may not have the capacity to invest their limited time and energy into something beyond what they're doing uh, during their days. And so I think that balancing act, everyone's experiencing a very different pandemic. I want to be really realistic. Some people do have that capacity, but I think in general, I just wanted to make that comment because uh, I think we, we do receive feedback, but it's, you know, perhaps not as widespread as 
as we might expect uh, if we weren't in a pandemic, but we are in a pandemic, right? It's, it's the reality. So I just want to balance all of those things. So, you know, I'm so appreciative. We still have 27 people on the call. Uh, yeah. two and a half hours or two and a quarter hours later, because that, that I think speaks to the commitment. Uh, but people who aren't on the call to the comments earlier, I think we are trying to figure out ways, whether it's sharing the recordings, asking for feedback in other ways. I think it is critical uh, to offer as many ways that people can be involved and not just right now, but it's an iterative process throughout because it's, it, I mean, I speak for myself, it waxes and wanes, right? People's availability and capacity to participate. So I just want to share an appreciation for, for everyone who's been able to participate for this length of time uh, given everything that's going on. Sorry, David, that was long-winded, but I just, I think, no, that's uh, great. you know, that's some of the great. comments made me think of that. And I, I want to get to Bruce. I just want to say one thing, though, Marie. Um, it's true, you know, if we had been doing this in the 70s, we would have been talking about open plan as the next greatest thing. Um, and we saw that that was very problematic. I will say that, um, because I didn't really mention my background at the beginning of the call, but I started out as an architect, but then I worked as a, a high school teacher and an assistant principal for 15 years. And over the last 20 years, I've been working nationally, internationally, and a lot in Massachusetts to do this kind of, what's the bridge between forward thinking, uh, ideas about, um, about educational approaches and the kind of buildings that will support them that aren't trendy, that are going to really kind of evolve over time. So, and the Mass School Building Authority, there is no other entity in the United States that is doing what the Mass School Building Authority is. They are, have a very thoughtful approach to their program. They're doing research on what, and doing post-occupancy studies on what's being used and how are these, you know, extended learning spaces being used and are they, how are they necessary, things like that. Um, and they have a set of architects, um, and Denisco is one of them, that are competing for these projects, but that are really open to kind of thinking about how do we do this right? So I do think that um, there's lots of examples we have about, um, about I, I think, not doing something that's trendy. We learned a lot in the open school um, uh, process uh, that we need to, if we're going to have connected environments, which is really desirable in a lot of ways, then we have to make sure that acoustically they work for people. Um, and we have to be thinking about wayfinding throughout the building and accessibility beyond just handicapped access. So all of those things, um, I think, you know, we're trying to be as thoughtful as we can about them. And, um, and I think there's a lot of um, also examples that we can look at. So I know that one of the things that some of the district folks are doing is looking at different schools um, that and, and experiencing them, what do they feel like inside? So I think that's a, an important part of it as well. So. Yeah, David, if I if I could just um, yeah. piggyback, I you know, um, probably a lot of folks in their careers uh, always look back, not Monday morning quarterbacking, but lessons learned. And I think we've all taken away a lot of lessons learned, not only what happened in the 60s and 70s, but also looking back at um, indoor environmental quality. That's critically important, right? We've all learned so much about what works well for student achievement. And then the pandemic has taken us to look at things totally differently than we would have in 2019. But, but as architects recognizing this building, hopefully will last beyond 50 years. Our goal is 75 years, obviously, or a little longer. But how, as we design things, how the spaces can change easily as the program changes and and that's going to be really important as we design whether it's a partition for example two classrooms you put a partition up well don't put piping and plumbing and technology on that wall because that wall may want to come down at some point in time in the future or whatever so we are always thinking about flexibility um, in the future as well so uh, we'll, we'll continue those conversations as we start laying out the building and the design and, and making sure that there's some kind of uh, forward thinking as we address this. Thanks, Donna. And, and Bruce, sorry to keep you waiting for so long. Hi, it's um, actually Mary Sayer, his wife. Oh, I didn't see I didn't see your name there, Mary. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't there. Um, we've been talking about flexibility in terms of the pandemic. I think um, the other big issue right now is climate change. And I think one of the things that we're understanding is that we need a citizenry 
that is connected to the environment and to um, nature. So for me, one of the educational goals and the goals of the building is to have that a big part of the educational process, uh, which might include you, you talk a little bit about uh, easy access to the outside, but I mm -hmm. would really go for almost a, a, a melding of those two things. Okay. And, I, and also outdoor landscapes that really promote educational places for gardens for the children. Um, I, I have to say, I taught at the common school and their ability to have children learn science, math, art, everything connected with the natural environment um, is very exciting to the children, number one. Yes. Uh, number two, it makes for a very uh, warm, humane kind of classroom because there's drawings of uh, wildflowers the kids have you know, gotten. Um, and also I would like to see within the classrooms opportunities for natural living organisms. Um, I'm looking at all those buildings and they're very institutional to me that I that you showed. Okay. I don't see plant material or, you know, so anyway, just, just creating opportunities for children really to interact with the natural environment and have their education, you know, uh, have that be part of their educational experience. Great, thank you very much, Mary. Yeah, definitely, um, you know, there's only so many of the design patterns that we can share but um, but certainly, you know, having most of the schools we're working with are very concerned with those issues of connecting to the outdoors, maximizing the use of their site, uh, both in terms of connecting to science curriculum and opportunities for gardening programs or a greenhouse, if that's appropriate, um, and as well as um, just easy access to kind of formal and informal kind of play areas. Um, and getting kids outside and moving. Um, uh, um, so, but, but what you're talking about in terms of biophilia, bringing plant material in um, uh, is something, it's, it's, it's something that we know is, creates a really great aesthetic and uh, we can certainly be looking at that. I, I feel that a lot of these things actually aren't that costly. I think it's mostly mm -hmm. thinking of them ahead of time so that um, yeah. they wouldn't add a lot to the budget but they would add a lot to the educational experience. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Got to keep the sure. running. Sure. Okay, Steve, I see your hand up. Yeah, so since this is open mic, um, I just want to do plus one to Mary. And I actually put this in as a written comment. And I didn't see it appear on the screen, but I, I think maybe it was Mary's outdoor spaces. But I think that the outdoor connection to the outdoors is critical. So the pandemic is actually one reason but also just the way students learn at this level, right? So, I mean, just look at the origins of kindergarten, right? So it has to do a lot with connection to, to nature, but also look at the names of the three elementary schools in Amherst. They all are named after natural features, Crocker Farm, Ford River, Wildwood. So that alone is a clue as to what's critical here, but, um, so a comment might be, so all the, all the photos that we saw were of the insides of buildings. And so maybe that's one, you know, maybe that's the next step here is looking at the programming as it relates to the outdoors and maybe the landscape, architect, I don't know when the landscape architects are coming on board or if they're on, you know, how they're being integrated in this, but I think not thinking of the landscape as something that will be done around the shell of the building, but thinking of it as critical to the building itself, I think is something yeah. that can make this a spectacular, yeah. spectacular building. Donna, do you want to say Yeah, sure, sure. No, thank you. And Steve, thank you. I, I think actually we had a couple of more slides that did respond to the outdoors, but probably um, not, not as, um, in depth as, as you're speaking to, but our landscape architects on board already, and it's an integral part. He is an integral part of our design team. And we work very closely with him as we look at all of the exterior features, all of the landscaping, et cetera. We also try to incorporate maybe even stormwater as part of an educational program and how that could play in. Um, our landscaping also, 
we like to look at holistically as relates to our climate and make sure that we plant the appropriate plantings and trees and shrubs so that um, they're drought resistant or, or they, they meet the environment in which they are so that the maintenance and durability of them are the same. But we will work with Mike and his team from a science perspective, making sure that if it's a big backyard program or science programs, how we can incorporate those features into the um, outdoors. Can I jump right. in just to, is, can I follow up on Donna's comment very yeah, briefly? Um, and, yeah. and I apologize. And I have just, an 11... a, just a heads up that we're we're heading into 11 o'clock. So yep, and, and that's my exit. Uh, I apologize. I have an 11 o'clock meeting that I need to get to. But uh, I did want to add, and, and I think she's on the call, which is we are incredibly fortunate in this district to have a K6 science coordinator who also spearheads um, our gardening program uh, and Jennifer Reese, and she's a longtime educator. Um, and so I'm not going to put Jen on the spot to be able to, to have to speak to that. But when we get to the topics around outdoor learning um, and, and some of the comments that were just made, uh, she's going to be an incredible resource to help us think about that. Um, and she, as she's an incredible resource for our elementary educators on science and use of outdoor spaces in general, even the ones that we currently have set up ourselves because it's not part of the building design in any of our buildings. So I just, we're very well situated for that. And, and just folks may not know uh, about Jennifer's role, but she is um, a rock star and we're really fortunate to have her on board. Great. And, um, and again, I'm sorry, I don't I know mean, sorry. Uh, I think related to the outdoor, I think it can have a big impact on the design. And I think that right now, all the classrooms right now, as in why would they have direct access to the outside? So if it's, if you want to minimize, I think what I've been hearing from everybody is a lot of connection to the outside, but if you go into a multi-story building, then you're gonna have started to have more barriers for the kids to have yeah. access to the outside, right? Yeah. So um, I hope that this is taken into account in the design. Right now, the kids, there's open, there's a door and they could go outside directly. Whereas if you have to go one step of flight of stairs or two flights of stairs, it puts a barrier to the time it might take to go and integrate to the outside the yeah. classroom into the outside so um i don't know how that can be solved but uh, yes well it's certainly going to be something that we're considering i mean there's lots of things to weigh out and one of the issues is sustainability as well because if we go with a newer building or a substantially renovated building um having a one-story building is not the most sustainable approach um in terms of the, the envelope of the building and the systems within it so um, so we're weighing all that stuff out, but definitely we want to be thinking about um, maximizing that access to the outdoors. Um, we are at 11 o'clock here or one minute past. I want to thank everybody for, um, for really sticking with us for the last two and a half hours. And thanks for your feedback. Um, um, I hope that in terms of shifting the focus of this, we got to address some more of your issues and we'll definitely be thinking um, as we move forward on how to best, you know, uh, structure these workshops so as to be able to get at the issues that are, are, are most important for people. We're definitely going to be looking into how to reach out more to the larger community um, uh, who may not have time to take part in one of these meetings and, and to teachers as well uh, within the con confines of their, their schedule. Um, and we'll, so we'll have you. these, yeah, we'll have these posted. We're, we're recording it. We'll have them posted and as well as the presentation. So folks can take time to, to comment on what, what is important to them. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank uh, you, everyone. We look forward to continuing the conversation. Excuse me, Donna you. or yeah. David. Sure. I was under the impression that this meeting was going till 1130, that it was three hours. And it's fine that we're ending early, but will the evening meeting also be two and a half, not three hours? So mm, six yes. to 830? We decided to limit it to two and a half hours, Jennifer, because, okay. because of the, the online format. We, yeah. we realized that three hours is a lot, especially in the yes. evening to ask of people. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.